Greetings ladies and gentlemen, I'm GC Smith and today we're going to be taking a look at the banned and restricted list update for Monday the 4th of April 2016. There have been a total of four changes uh, to various formats in total uh, this time around, uh, with three changes to modern and one change to the vintage list. So let's take a look at the modern list first. Eye of Ugin has been banned to the surprise of literally no one, while Ancestral Vision has been unbanned as has Sword of the Meek. Now these are quite interesting changes, uh, Eye of Ugin aside because everyone expected that, um, although we will take a quick look at that first. So what does the Eye of Ugin ban mean? Well it basically means the Eldrazi deck is no longer winning turn 5 uh, a large chunk of the time, uh, which is good because the Eldrazi deck is incredibly difficult to beat, especially when it gets going. Um, the combination of small creatures that become big for a turn, uh, big creatures that interact with your hand, uh, big creatures that are hard to remove, as well as a creature that can be good at any stage of the game, uh, was kind of detrimental to the format. Combine that with, say, the shenanigans of the blue-white Eldrazi deck that just, oh, clogged the board up so, so, so much. And, yeah, you can see why um, Eye of Ugin was banned. Now, it does also affect the Tron decks. Uh, Tron does lose its ability to shoot out big threats. Uh, but I think that's fair. I, in fact, don't believe any deck that can do the things like a turn three Khan uh, should have easy access to tutoring up even bigger endgames in the form of cards like Emrakul or various Ulamog or Kozilek or other cards like that. It really doesn't need the ability to tutor up that kind of stuff. It's already got the ability to tutor up any land it wants. Uh, and it also has the ability to run ways to tutor up its other colorless threats. So it really, really didn't need that kind of uh, land in its deck. So I think that's actually quite healthy for the format. The fact that Tron also loses that uh, land allows uh, control decks to exist slightly more. Uh, obviously, control decks still probably aren't really that good in modern overall, uh, not with these list changes. Uh, obviously, we just have to wait to see, but they're no longer like auto lose to Tron, so that's good. Uh, the other two changes, uh, Ancestral Vision has been... It's kind of a bland change, and I think it's more of a do-nothing change. Uh, Ancestral Vision strikes me as one of these cards which had no reason to ever be banned in the first place, especially not when all the Cascade uh, cards that could cascade into it are also banned. Um, sure, draw three for one mana investment at some point in the game is quite powerful. However, it's not that powerful when it's draw three in four turns. Uh, it's probably good on turn one, um, but pretty much with the length of most modern games I've seen, you're much better with Serum Visions on turn one um, in most games. And Serum Visions is a better late game draw as well. I mean, as stress all vision will get to the point where it's like, oh, top deck, cool. So in four turns I can draw three cards. I'm probably dead by then. Um, yeah, so I'm not really sure if Ancestral Vision will have a huge impact on the format. Certainly, it's possible that Control Decks will look to picking it up, uh, but I almost imagine Control Decks might want the card advantage somewhat swifter, uh, especially with, again, how fast uh, Modern is. Uh, generally, if you're a Control Deck in Modern, you either die with no cards in hand or a handful of cards. Um, and I'm not sure how big an impact Ancestral Vision will make to that, but again, we'll have to wait and see. Sword of the Meek, however, is a far more interesting unbanned, and it's something that I didn't really expect to see unbanned after the banning of Splinter Twin, because it's a combo engine. You know, it's part of the two-card engine for a really powerful, uh, slow, but powerful win condition. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Sword of the Meek does, it combines really well with a card called Fopter Foundry. Uh, Fopter Foundry, I think, is one blue and one black or white mana, I believe, and basically it reads um, pay one and sacrifice a non-token artifact, and then you gain one life and put a 1-1 one, one blue Fopter token with flying onto the battlefield. Sword of the Meek says that when, uh, as long as this card is in your graveyard, whenever a 1-1 one, one creature comes into the battlefield under your control, you may return it from your graveyard to play attached to that creature, and it gives 
equipped creature plus one plus two. Now, the fact that it gives a quick creature a bonus is probably the irrelevant part. Sure, getting a 2-3 flyer for one mana is not bad, uh, but really the synergy is you have Sword of the Meek on the field, you have Fopter Foundry on the field, you pay one mana, sacrifice Sword of the Meek, it goes to the graveyard, you get a 1-1 Fopter, then that triggers Sword of the Meek and you return it to the battlefield. Obviously this only really works because Sword of the Meek uh, gets sacrificed as part of the cost for Fopter Foundry, uh, but it's a really cool uh, synergy behind that. So you can make as many Fopters and gain as much life each turn as you have mana, uh, which can get really overwhelming uh, very, very quickly as the game progresses. The fact that you can actually add in an infinite cl uh, combo uh, with the Ironworks from, uh, I think, original uh, Mirrodin. Yeah, Croc Clan Ironworks uh, from Fifth Dawn. So the original Mirrodin block, which basically states uh, sacrifice an artifact and add two colorless mana to your pool. Um, so you combine that with the fact that you can pay the colorless mana for working with the Fopter Foundry. And every time you sacrifice Sword of the Meek, you create a Fopter. Then you can sacrifice that Fopter to get two mana, which allows you to sacrifice the sword twice, and get two uh, Fopters. Effectively, therefore, once you've put in one mana investment initially, sacrificing the sword to get a Fopter, you now get two Fopters per... You can just keep sacking the Fopters to get two Fopters. And since each Fopter you sacrifice gives you two, you net a positive amount of infinite A, infinite fopters infinite life and infinite mana sure all that mana is colorless but there are ways for you to utilize that quite possibly this is uh obviously one of the synergies uh fopter foundry also works really well that kind of combo with um ensnaring bridge because your opponents don't really get to attack you while you slowly build up this army of like fopters and then you go sack the bridge kill you that kind of thing works as well. Obviously, you don't necessarily have to sack the bridge. If you've only got a load of 1-1 Fopters, uh, it doesn't really matter. There's also the nice fact that this kind of two-card synergy, you only need to, say, run one or two versions of each card in a deck to get that synergy that can occasionally pop up. Um, and you can run that in decks that already exist, such as um, Lantern Control, the deck that controls what the opponent has on top of their library, and will definitely help speed up those matches, which I'm not sure anyone's really going to complain about too much, apart from losing to Lantern Control. Um, but I think it's a really nice change. I personally like this uh, unbanning as well, more because I like playing Control and Combo decks. Now... I get to play a combo control deck in modern. Awesome. This would be quite good. Just such a shame that I couldn't get a copy from uh, Sword of the Meek from a website or a copy of Tesseret on a website before they just shop in value because they pretty much sold out as soon as the, wrist, uh, the list updates went online. Now, taking a look at the one vintage change we've had. Uh, the change was Lodestone Golem is restricted. Now, I think this is simply due to uh, Mishra workshop, Mishra's workshop-based decks or uh, shops or hangerback shops or whatever you want to call it, uh, simply because those decks basically shut out all other decks. The ability to very quickly make um, what is a very non-creature spell-heavy format pay loads of extra mana for their non-artifact non-creature spells can really punish uh, other decks. The fact that the uh, Chalice of the Void is restricted doesn't really change much either already. Uh, that was restricted, I think, last update. Um, but yeah, like, Lodestone Golem is just really good because it's a beta that's hard to kill, especially when everything costs you one more to cast, even with uh, all the Moxes, because you've only got one copy of each, so they're not going to show up all that necessarily all that often. Overall, I think these are positive changes for the various formats. Not that I'm ever going to play Vintage uh, anytime soon, but the ability to make a different kind of modern deck, even if I'm probably going to be horrible at brewing a deck for a format I barely play, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun uh, to see the changes. And I actually look forward to watching uh, modern deck uh, format, <laughs> modern format tournaments uh, again, because the Eldrazi decks just made me really hate that format. So thank you very much for watching, guys. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this video. What are your opinions on the changes to the uh, bans and restricted lists? Uh, anything you like, anything you don't like, anything you wish had been unbanned as well, or banned as well. And uh, yeah, just give me your comments below. Uh, hope you like and subscribe and share this video around. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.